Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SCA's 27th monthly Zoom presentation. And a special thank you to our guests from our partners in this presentation, Preservation Houston. We're happy you took the time out of your summer evening to watch an SCA presentation, and we hope you enjoy the show. And for anybody watching the recording of this episode of the SCA's monthly presentations, who is not a member of the SCA, we earnestly ask you to consider joining. Funding for the various activities of the SCA comes almost exclusively from our membership. Just visit our website at www.sca-roadside.org and follow the links. Tonight's presentation is by Gregory Smith. He is the National Register Coordinator for the Texas Historical Commission, where he has worked as a historian since 1966. In addition to overseeing the National Register Program, he reviews federal and state rehab tax credit applications and participates in the Section 106, 106 review process. He holds an MA in history from the University of Delaware and a BA in art history from the University at wow. Buffalo. He has been an SCA member for over three decades, a former vice president of the SCA, and has been to all 254 Texas counties. That's quite an accomplishment. We look forward to listening to Gregory as he talks about the SA in general, in Texas in general, and Houston in particular. So without further ado, Greg, if you would please unmute yourself uh, and start your show. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, very good. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, this has been interesting putting this together because we have two audiences, which is why I call this Preservation Fellow Travelers. So we have our friends at Preservation Houston, and we have the SEA membership. Hopefully there's some overlap uh, there. Uh, so I'm, I, it's been a challenge. I'm targeting this to our, our, our new friends in, in Houston and then at the, at the SEA membership at large. But uh, I did promise that this was gonna be all about Texas. And so that's what we're, we're going to do after a quick detour. Let's see. Okay. All right, hopefully you can see the slide has changed. Uh, this, is, this is what I agreed to talk about. Uh, Texas in general, Houston in particular, and touch upon National Register work at the Texas Historical Commission, that's true. I'm gonna be doing all of those things. Um, I have been photographing in Texas for, since I moved here in 1996. Uh, so I've amassed tens of thousands of photographs uh, all, over, all over the state. So I'm gonna show you some of those tonight. Um, I, I grew up in a part of Texas called Rochester, New York, which of course is not in Texas, but according to this map, it's pretty close. Um, uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about my, my background. Um, in Rochester, New York and in other parts of Western New York, we have these things um, and people in Texas are, are, they must be wondering what is a Texas hot? Uh, a Texas hot is a sort of hot dog. And um, in Western New York, uh, in the Midwest and so forth, you often see them called Coney dogs. But uh, this is the closest to Texas I got when I was growing up. Um, also the same cuisine, the, the, the Texas hot is known in Texas as a Coney Island. Uh, it's known as such throughout the Midwest, the Great Plains. Uh, this is our, our last stop uh, outside of, uh, outside of, of Texas. This is the Alamo in Ocean City, Maryland, uh, which apparently is the worst hotel in Ocean City, Maryland, according to the uh, TripAdvisor reviews. And we did stop and uh, talk with the owner and looked around. And while historically the fabric is intact and it's beautiful, um, it's not a great place to stay. Uh, you can tell this is not in Texas because the Alamo has a sombrero. You would never see that in Texas. Uh, I'm going to start with a little story. Um, when This is the seminal experience that I had in roadside architecture was when I was about four or five years old, um, traveling down to um, Atlantic City, New Jersey with my, with my family. Some of my earliest mem memories, um, my first experiences with a motel. Um, I don't think this one that I'm showing is the motel because it was definitely not this nice on the inside. Um, my first experience with miniature golf, 
Uh, and this was a miniature golf course that I, I did play at when I was about four or five years old. And this is what I remembered for a long time after that. This is about the state of Lucy the Elephant um, as she looked in about 1970 um, in uh, very poor repair, very dilapidated. And me as a four or five year old um, saw this and there was a sign that said, save me on it. And it stayed with me um, for a long time. And uh, this is one of those things that got me into historic, pres uh, historic preservation. Um, and, you know, what a perfect way to attract the attention of a child um, in the history of old things as it's in the shape of an animal and it has a name and it needs to be saved. And so I, I carried this with me um, for a couple decades, this memory, uh, and, you know, and would look back and, and, and think about it and go, was this a real place? What, what was this place? Um, and so when I was studying at University at Buffalo, I was studying architectural history. And uh, as I browsed through the stacks at the uh, architecture library, I came across this book, The Well-Built Elephant by J.J.C. Andrews. And that's when I realized, oh, um, well, one, Lucy the Elephant was real, um, was important enough to put on the cover of a book, name a book after it. And this book was chock full of photographs of roadside architecture. So this is when I first realized, oh, there's, there's, uh, there are other people that are interested in what I'm interested in, and it intersects with what I'm studying as, as well. And so um, over the next few years, I collected more books, Main Street to Miracle Mile by Chester Liebs, who's one of the founders of the SEA, Gaspard and Lodging by John Bader, um, End of the Road by John Margulies, um, whose photographs are now at the Library of Congress and all his photographs you can see online. And it was the Ducks and Diners book that was published by the National Trust, uh, where I first learned about the SEA. I was flipping through it and uh, there was a reference to it that the Society for Commercial Archaeology is such a thing. And so um, I, uh, I, I looked into it and realized that uh, the SEA was having a conference in Pittsburgh, uh, not too far away from where I was um, in uh, the fall of 1990. So I attended it and it changed my life. Uh, so I joined the SEA and uh, here's our website, uh, sea-roadside.org. I'm gonna show this again um, to make sure you have it. Um, everyone should go visit the site. Uh, and, uh, and, and get to know the SEA and look at all the things that the SEA has to offer, um, including the publications. Um, we have tour guides. There's information about um, uh, the past tours that we've had. We're still doing ongoing tours. Um, our tours are a lot of fun. Um, and this, this is a quote from the SEA website. The SEA is an all volunteer membership organization that celebrates the living history of America's roadside and I included some photographs of some of our roadside events, um, including a, a New Jersey diner tour, our um, 2008 uh, tour in New Mexico, uh, where you can see that the happy the, the happy tour members. Um, this is right after we um, had um, put um, uh, the the large man figure holding the burger. Um, he was uh, he was knocked down, and so we had a, a, a raising. Of, uh, of, of him as this group effort and took this photograph in, in celebration of our, our good work for the benefit of roadside preservation. Going back um, 1978, this was our first publication. Um, and it was interesting as I was looking through it, uh, there's a little article that says concerning SCA and it still holds true today. Um, it laid out what the SEA was interested in, transportation facilities, highways, airports, bus stations, roadside development, gas, food, and lodging, the diners and hotels, um, traditional business districts, movie theaters, drugstores, apartment stores, and recreation facilities. Um, we, we still do this. Uh, this has been an ongoing effort. And the one thing that has changed is that um, our understanding of what is significant um, changes as time moves on. And so now, of course, the SEA is interested, like everybody who's interested in preservation in what was in uh, the built environment of the 70s and the 1980s. So um, time marches on, our, our interest in things 
um, it becomes larger based on that. Uh, and so we're, we're always um, trying to stay at the forefront. Um, one of the things that was great about the SEA at its founding is that there, it showed that there was interest in preserving things that were being probably more or less left out of mainstream preservation. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it, it's important to, um, to push the envelope. Uh, in in that respect, and um, I'm I'm happy to say that um, preservation movement in general has moved forward as well. And so you'll see from some of my um, examples of what we've nominated to the National Register in in Texas, it's right in line with this understanding of looking at the recent past, looking at the vernacular, looking at the ordinary, which is sometimes really extraordinary. Um, that's that's important. Um, as, as uh, time has moved on, uh, the SEA has also uh, kept at the forefront of, um, of documenting the roadside. In the fall of 2005, we published a special issue on segregation on the road. I had an article that was featured in there um, where we focused on the realities of, of, um, of segregation and, and structural racism and its effect on the roadside. And so the SEA, um, a lot of a lot of what we study and aim to preserve um, are things for which people have uh, a lot of nostalgia. Um, but there are other sides to the story as well, and we really try to try to frame that um, as realistically as 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 possible. Um, and then you know our our journal is published twice a year. Um, our journal is fantastic full color with great articles. Um, this one um, features an article by a guy Car Carwile of, uh, about the um, Jack Tar Hotel in Galveston. Uh, there's a great variety of articles um, presented and this comes out twice a year. And so I'm showing the slide again, just to make sure you see our website, www.sea-roadside.org. Um, come check us out. Um, all right, so I work for the Texas Historical Commission. So a lot of what I'm gonna be presenting to tonight is how my work at the State um, Historic Preservation Agency intersects with the SEA. Um, and so uh, we have a few other programs. I, as I mentioned, I oversee the National Register of Historic Places. We also have a historic highways program um, and it's at our website, thc.texas.gov slash highways. And so we have done comprehensive surveys of, um, of the Bankhead Highway, the Old Spanish Trail, the Meridian Highway as they go through, through Texas. And so there's lots of documentation about these historic roads, including um, the roadside architecture, the fabric of the roads themselves. What you're seeing here on the left side is a Probably the best preserved um, section of brick highway. This was an interstate highway um, at the time it was built. A section of the Bankhead Highway um, in in Eastland County and the Bankhead Hotel and Apartments, also um, uh, not not far from there in um, Strawn, Texas. And so, a little bit more information about the Historic Highways Pro Program. Um, you know, go go check out the website. There's lots of information. Um, the Texas Historical Commission started as um, the State uh, uh, Historic Survey Committee uh, before um, we even had a state preservation office. And so the, the task of this committee was to go around Texas and, and document things that merited preservation. And so there were teams of people that went out and photographed and, and, and documented these properties with a survey. The historical marker program in Texas was established at that time. Uh, in the 1970s, the historic survey uh, fo focused on uh, taking medium format photographs of sites all, all over the state. Um, and all of these photographs, 25,000 of them are now being shared on the portal to Texas history. So I've got the URL there, Texas history .unt.edu. It is a huge website full of all sorts of documentation. 
but the Texas Historical Commission is one of the partners. So lots of our photographs are on there. As you can imagine, the photographs that were taken in the 1970s, for the most part, are gonna be photographs of 19th century through early 20th century buildings. But uh, even, even when the, the subject of the photograph might be a Victorian era building or a series of buildings, um, as you go through the collection online, uh, you, you find things that they just, you know, just got captured along with it, including a lot of great neon signs, a lot of great roadside architecture in, in city centers. So uh, this building, 219 Main Street in Houston, it's been demolished, unfortunately, along with everything on the block. It's now a parking garage, but we have this photograph and you know, holy cow, the pink pussycat. Um, so, I mean, this wasn't um, the, the subject in the mind of the photographer, I'm pretty sure, when this photograph was taken. Probably uh, at the time wished that the pink pussycat sign and the other things were not there. Um, but we're really fortunate that this has been preserved. All right, so I'm gonna go into the National Register of Historic Places um, and uh, just show you some highlights of, uh, of roadside related properties that have been listed in the National Register in, in Texas. It's not all of them, um, but it's quite a few of them. And they're roughly chronological order of when they were listed. Um, we've done a lot of work on Route 66. Uh, and so one of the first roadside oriented uh, uh, nominations in the state was the Route 66 6th Street Historic District in Amarillo, it was listed in 1994. And it includes a, a mix of roadside related resources, like uh, there's a gas stations and root beer joints and so forth, but also the sort of um, one and two part commercial block buildings that you would see on a typical main street um, on Route 66 or off Route 66. The Texas Tourist Camp in Decatur, Wise County. Uh, this is a real gem. Um, uh, uh, using a lot of petrified wood. Um, there are other parts of Texas that also have a lot of petrified wood. Uh, Glen Rose, not too far from Wise County being one of them where there are multiple buildings um, made out of petrified wood. So this was listed in 1997. I, I started at the agency in 1996. Um, I know in my introduction it said, um, it was 1966, which I would have been one year old and that would have been remarkable. I started in 1996, um, hired to do a survey of all the historical markers in the state. At the time we had about 12,000 of them. And so I was part of a team who got paid, believe it or not, to drive around the state and find them all. Um, that's how I got a lot of the Texas counties under my belt. I was hired the next year um, as a, as a new staff person in the National Register program, working with Dwayne Jones, who's now at, um, he's a director of the Galveston Historical Foundation. Um, and he was also an SCA member. And so we had that connection as, as well. Uh, this is the first photograph I ever took in Texas on my first visit in 1993, uh, when I was taking a road trip on Route 66. So the tower station, the U drop in, this also happened to be one of the first nominations that came across my desk um, when I was a, a new hire. I believe this was the first nomination that I, I processed. Um, we received a grant from the National Park Service uh, to do a survey of Route 66 and also prepare National Register nom nominations for them. We've done, we've since updated that survey using um, more current documentation standards, but uh, we got uh, several listings out of this in the process, including the Vega Motel, which is on the far west side of the Texas Panhandle. Um, and this was interesting because at the time this was listed, the fact that it had this faux stone, like a permastone type finish on it, was um, that was a, a question in our heads uh, because the faux stone was not 50 years old at that time. And with the National Register, um, there's a 50 year rule of thumb where something has to be at least 50 years old in order to be listed unless, unless it's exceptionally significant. Um, and this we were able to make the case that despite the faux stone not being 50 years old, the, 
motel had all those other character defining features that made it recognizable as a uh, roadside lodging uh, from the time it, it was built. We did the nomination for the Orange Show. This was one where it was less than 50 years old at the time of, of listing. And so we made a case for exceptional significance. Uh, this, uh, this was commercial in nature when it was built. So this, is, this intersects perfectly with the original mission of the, um, of the SCA and the use of the word commercial in the SCA's name. Um, this was built by Jeff McKissick who did not fancy himself an artist. Uh, he built this to be a roadside attraction and an educational attraction um, to teach people about the value of, um, of oranges. He wrote a book called You Can Live to Be 80 and Still Be Spry. It was all about oranges. He was also very much into steam power. Um, he built this by himself uh, in Houston on a, on a large lot. Uh, for those of you, those of you in Houston know this, but those of, and uh, many of you outside of Houston would as well, there is no zoning in Houston. You can essentially build whatever you want, wherever you want. And so this is an, in an otherwise residential um, neighbor, neighborhood. Um, he did take out a building permit. Um, he was going to build a beauty salon and then he uh, amended that. Um, and uh, wrote on, on the uh, permit, had a better idea, the orange show, and it became this. The Glen Rio Historic District is, uh, is in two states. It is on the state line in New Mexico and in Texas. And so um, I, I know that, um, I think a lot of the images that I'm showing you are uh, showing these places um, in, in, in a better day. Um, I, I know that places like Glen Rio um, where there are very few people living and, uh, and no businesses to speak of, um, these buildings are, are really threatened. They're definitely underutilized. Things get broken, things get stolen, things get um, van vandalized and, and so forth. Well, we did the nomination for the Triangle Motel in Amarillo, also on Route 66. This is on a triangle shaped parcel uh, on the east side of Am Amarillo, um, not far from the uh, airport. Uh, one of the reasons why um, there's interest in nominating properties to the National Register is there are opportunities to take advantage of state and federal tax credits uh, and listing in the National Register uh, uh, meets the first requirement that a property must be eligible and ultimately listed in the National Register in order to qualify for the federal credits and they will also qualify for the state credits uh, with the National Register listing. Um, Oakdale Park in Glen Rose, Somerville County. This is, I, I mentioned Glen Rose. This is another one of those towns with a lot of petrified wood and a lot of great rock buildings. This was a, a, um, a large tourist camp um, that had cabins, but it also had a swimming pool. It had a building they called the casino. Um, it was meant as a resort, not just roadside lodging. And so this was listed as a historic district. One of the things that was interesting about this was we also pushed the period of significance to include the enlargement of the facility to include spaces for, um, for campers and, and, uh, uh, and portable, camping trailers and things like that. So as the, um, so as the, uh, the, the expectations of, of, of travelers lodgings change, uh, this facility changed with it. And so we wanted to make sure that that full story was recognized in the National Register um, documentation. Uh, we do lots of historic districts in small towns, large, ci large cities, and, uh, and so we're seeing more and more of things like this, great roadside architecture um, that is in an otherwise, uh, it's in a downtown location. And so Reed Flowers um, in the heart of Waco, Texas, uh, we're, we're seeing more and more things like this. Um, and this is an older building that was modified in, I'm assuming the 1950s. And so at one point, things like slip covers and signage um, back if this was nominated in 1970s, 1980s, maybe um, everybody would be like looking down, 
upon all the new stuff that was added. Whereas certainly now we embrace that and we try to be as open-minded as we possibly can about um, about things like, like this when it comes to National Register. We've nominated segments of the highway, including many segments on Route 66 in the Panhandle. Uh, this was one that we did a few years ago, the Old Spanish Trail, which was a road that I was familiar with. Uh, I'd gotten a call um, from somebody who asked if you can nominate a road to the National Register. Um, we receive calls like this all the time. Almost all the nominations in Texas are initiated outside our agency. Um, we frankly don't have the time to pick and choose what's gonna be nominated. We have so much interest coming from people all over the state. And so I'd gotten this call saying, hey, can you nominate a road? And uh, I said, well, which road? And as uh, the gentleman was explaining what it was, I said, I know this road. I've traveled on this road. Um, yes, let's, let's do this. Um, and the research on this was really interesting because this um, made it to the Dallas Morning News. There was a full page of articles about the completion of this road in 1922 and how remarkable it was um, for this portion of Texas, which is about halfway between Austin and Houston, um, a multi-county area where this was the first section of road that had been improved with concrete in 1922, it made the Dallas Morning News, which was a paper of record really for the state of, of Texas at that time. This is the Abilene Court in, um, in Abilene, Texas. This is, this is one that I first discovered when I was um, doing the historic marker research and at the same time um, tracing while I could the, um, the route of the Bankhead Highway across the state. And uh, this is what really got my attention was the ghost signage on this thing that advertised rates of $1 and $3 per night, which was remarkable. Uh, and so when we did the um, historic resource survey for the Bankhead Highway, um, this came out as, as one of the top examples of, of a tourist court of any sort on the Bankhead Highway, but especially one um, like this that had the parking and the entrances to all the units on the inside. And so uh, somebody staying here would drive through this gate and all of the facilities, the, the entrances, the little um, carports and so forth were on the inside. So it, it, it was secure, safe. Um, and uh, so this is, this is a rare example. Um, unfortunately, there's so much asbestos um, in the rooms that um, they probably won't be able to rehabilitate it. Um, they can probably save the exterior brick wall, but this is gonna be a huge challenge just with remediation of, of this building. Um, this is in Austin. Uh, this is uh, Fiesta Gardens. And uh, this was a public-private partnership uh, dating to the mid 1960s, part of the uh, improvement of the shoreline of uh, Lake Austin, which is now Lady Bird Lake. And it was a situation where uh, a group came in and said, we will, we will develop this. And uh, they threw all these ideas against the wall to see what stuck. And they apparently went with everything. And so um, it's called Fiesta Gardens. It's in the east side of Austin, which has had in this area, especially a predominant Latino community. Um, and so they, uh, they called it Fiesta Gardens at the time. Um, everybody apparently was interested in performance uh, on water skis. And so there is uh, uh, a large uh, viewing uh, grandstand for watching water skiing performances on the lake. Uh, they uh, had uh, you know, Mexican food and so forth. They had a little Mexican um, shopping area and, and so forth. Um, designed perhaps by people who had never been to Mexico. Um, it looks a little bit more inspired by maybe New Mexico, uh, Taos, um, not, not Mexico uh, per se. Um, it started off commercial, it failed, and uh, within a few years, and now it's a city park. Um, and it's very popular. It's where um, they, we have quinceaneras held there. Uh, the Pride Festival, the Hot Sauce Festival, um, and it's beloved in the community. Um, it wasn't always that way when it was first being built and 
first, uh, first being in use in the 1960s. A um, couple more examples of River Oaks courts um, out in the hill country in Bandera County was listed in 2019. And um, just a few weeks ago, the Pan American Courts and Cafe in Laredo. This is on San Bernardo Boulevard, um, which was the, um, the Meridian Highway, um, just a few miles from where it ends at the Mexican border. And so again, all these nominations have been initiated outside our agency. And so this is partly a testament to the sort of work that's being done by the SEA in raising awareness of places like these over the past several decades um, that um, uh, more and more people look at these now and they're recognizing these places as historic and significant, worthy of preservation, and hopefully opening up the door for rehabilitation through the state and federal tax credits. I'm gonna go, let's see, how much time do I have? I'm just about on time. I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth here because this is such a quintessential Texas story. This is the Texas pool in, in Plano in Collin County. Um, it's up here. It's north of Dallas in a suburb of, of Plano. I had gotten a phone call again, uh, somebody asking, can you nominate a swimming pool to the National Register? And uh, I said, depends on the pool. Oh, we've done it before. Uh, what pool do you have in mind? And they said, well, it's the first pool shaped like Texas. And I said, yes, let's, let's do this. And so I assisted with this no nomination. And um, it was a great experience in, in um, looking at a property from many different perspectives, which we try to flesh out in all of the nominations that we do. This came to us as this fun thing, this Texas shaped pool. Um, and it was very interesting to, to delve into it and looking at it from many perspectives. Um, and I was able to do fun things like this. So I, I was wondering, is there, how accurate is this pool? It's obviously it's stretched a little bit east-west. Um, I superimposed a map of Texas on it for the nomination. When I wrote the description, uh, my description uh, was full of references to different cities. So. That, that pool, that's um, that, um, the slide that's situated in uh, New Mexico. Um, it empties out in the vicinity of uh, Odessa, uh, thing, things like that. The shallow end is in South Texas. And my joke, sorry if you're from Dallas, my joke is always, well, everyone knows the shallowest part of Texas is Dallas. Uh, sorry if you're from Dallas, it's just a joke. Um, and so uh, we, we delved into why was this pool here? Um, it wasn't a pool where somebody would pay admission. Uh, it was really part of a suburban development. And this was a major amenity uh, that would attract people to buy their new suburban home in this particular tract. Um, it was published in the Dallas Morning News. Um, the subdivision was called North Dallas Estates and it, it was huge. And this, this pool did the trick. Um, it, it got publicized in the Dallas Morning News. As far as I could tell, it was the first pool in, t in Texas, if not the world, shaped like Texas. Um, but that led me to think, well, what other pools do we have that are shaped like Texas? And so I started doing more research as to uh, how, where are these other pools? Are there other pools? Where are they? How big are they? Are there other Texas-shaped bodies of water? And I found lots of examples. Um, for those of you that are not in from Texas, you, you're familiar with the shape of Texas. The shape of Texas is a very distinctive shape. Um, and uh, if, if you ever come to HEB, uh, which is our regional grocery store, they have tortilla chips shaped like Texas. In the course of doing this nomination, I was really looking for more and more examples of just how the shape of Texas is used in everyday life. Um, I found not quite a kitchen sink, but a, a bar size sink shaped like Texas. It's used in logos. You can do a lot of things to the shape of Texas where it's not going to be an accurate depiction of Texas, but it still looks like Texas. You can take parts of it away and it's still Texas. Um, and so the nomination included information about you know, what makes the shape of Texas such a great graphic symbol. You can put it in a square. You can put it, which is, it's on our state highway signs. You can, it can be um, circumscribed in a circle. 
uh, like our Texas historical markers. Um, I did research on how did Texas, how did the shape of Texas be become a recognizable symbol? And it, it turned out it wasn't until really the 1930s that the shape of Texas was being used um, to promote Texas. Um, before that time, um, it, was, it was generally the Lone Star. Um, so around the time of the Texas Centennial in 1936, you saw it being used more in advertising, literally at the side of the road, at um, dozens of, uh, of state entrances um, along the border to, um, to the outlying states, you would be greeted by the shape of Texas as you, uh, as you came in. Um, going back to these other Texas-shaped pools, I looked for as many as I could. Um, you've got the big Texan pool, which is um, off of Route 66 in Amarillo, Six Flags uh, Fiesta, Texas, a giant theme park, um, Sometime after 1995, um, up in, uh, in Normandy, there was an, uh, not long after the Texas pool was built, there was a, another development that promoted its Texas shape pool. Um, those of you in Houston know the Lazy River on top of the Marriott Marquis Houston. Um, it's a pool, it's also a Lazy River, um, which is on top of a building, it's remarkable. That's probably the most, the most recent example. But then bodies of water, I found one that's approximately 645 feet across. Um, there's more than one of these um, stock ponds, um, usually on a ranch or farm, um, where the owner takes such pride in the shape. Um, and in the state of Texas, this is one up in Rockwell. This is the largest one that I know of. Um, the Gulf Coast has been sort of blown out of uh, just erosion or what have you. Uh, but as I said, you can you can mess with the shape, and it still is recognizable as as a shape of of Texas. Um, and then ultimately, I I I looked at in the whole notion of other Texas shape pools and found a smattering of ads in the Dallas Morning News just in a five year period of apartments um, promoting Texas style living with Texas shape pools. So this was a thing. Um, I also talked about the um, the reality of segregation. So this was a pool that was built in the Texas suburbs in the 1960s. And so the whole notion of who got to own these houses, um, obviously not African-Americans, it, it would have been restricted at that point. And so um, we, um, we include that information in all the nominations that we do as, as applicable. Um, so we're, we're telling the full story. And not, and not just who was included, but who was excluded and, and why. Um, coming up, the Longhorn Ballroom in Dallas. Uh, this is um, you know, one of those things that the, the SEA would definitely pull over for on a tour. Um, I'm pretty sure it was on the, um, on the tour of, of Dallas back in the 1990s. You'll see in the photograph on the left, um, tonight, Sex Pistols, Merle Haggard. Um, this is when the Sex Pistols played in 1978. Um, our friend Steph McDougall um, is preparing this nomination. I assisted to flesh out the story of uh, the emergence of punk rock in Texas with the performances um, by the Sex Pistols. So here we have Bob Wills and the Sex Pistols and everyone in between, Willie Nelson, Merle Haggard, um, and uh, 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 all the country greats had, had played here. Also coming up, this is going to be very exciting, especially for the folks in Houston, the Beer Can House. Um, I have been uh, working with the, um, the uh, Orange Show uh, uh, Foundation, which owns the Beer Can House, and this nomination is going to be prepared um, at some point this year. We have already determined it eligible a long time ago, and so we're very excited to see this one come forward. Uh, for more information, if you want to see anything related to the National Register or actually read these nominations, you can go to the Texas Historical Commission website. Um, I think, do I have the URL? It's uh, www.thc.texas.gov slash NRHP. Um, that'll take you right to our National Register page and uh, you'll see a link to our database. And so you will be able to search our 3,400 
no nominations. Um, almost all of them have been scanned. They're text searchable. And so you'll be able to download any of these online. You'll see some of our recent listings include the Elder Ada Ballroom in Houston, which was an important African-American nightclub and also uh, linked to the Pan American Courts in Laredo. Uh, and so I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up with um, just some photos that I've taken. And uh, I've got, a, I have a hundred slides and uh, I'm not gonna get through them all. And so I'm gonna go through these real fast. It's gonna be a superficial tour. I'm not gonna be able to go into detail about what a lot of these places are. I'm gonna whet your appetite on uh, the great things that are in Houston and outside and, uh, and give you some links as to where you can find more of this stuff. Um, I have a uh, Instagram account. I am Clive78757 uh, on Instagram. And so uh, this is just a sampling of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of photos that I've, I've taken that I've posted. Um, so many of the photographs in my presentation tonight are from my Instagram account. Um, I want to put a shout out to Mod Texas, um, which also has an Instagram account, which is fantastic. Uh, as we talk about fellow travelers, um, you know, our, our, our friends at Mod Texas are doing a remarkable job of documenting um, the modern movement, including roadside architecture, all over the state. Uh, when I started um, taking photographs of this stuff in Texas and posting things online, um, obviously, there wasn't a lot of this stuff going on. And uh, I'm really happy to say that there are other people out there. We've got a large community now of people that are interested in this stuff. They're posting their own photographs. Um, Mod Texas is especially good um, when it comes to um, uh, uh, some great narratives that they're adding to their photographs. You can learn a little bit about, about those, those places that they're documenting. It's fantastic. Um, also a shout out to Jim Parsons and David Bush, Houston Deco. This is, this is their book, um, which also has a lot of roadside architecture in it that you will be interested in. Um, I, I first got my uh, digital camera around 2003. Um, I've always taken a lot of photographs of roadside ar architecture, but then with the advent of digital photography, um, I wasn't paying every time I, uh, I, I pushed the I pushed the uh, I pushed the shutter key, and so um, I started taking photographs in earnest all over the place. And so uh, I, I first started doing, trying to be as comprehensive as I could at that time, looking at the roadside environment, um, starting in, in Beaumont, Texas. And unfortunately, these next three slides I'm showing you, they're all gone. All of these properties are gone. This one always struck me. I loved this. This was a Texas State Optical Company that had been um, uh, repurposed as an adult movie theater, um, but they kept the glasses and said, and printed, look, look, in each of the lenses. Kind of dangerous to take photographs of places like this, especially with people walking in and out. Um, you got to be careful. Um, the pig stand in Beaumont, which was recently demolished, um, despite our pleadings, um, despite offerings of, you know, potential for listing in the National Register, ability to rehabilitate for use for tax credits, uh, fell on deaf ears. And so we lost one of the great pieces of roadside architecture in the state in Beaumont. And then finally, this gas station, which is also featured in Houston Deco, um, 1937 gas station, which was torn down um, Sometime after, obviously, after I took this photo, it's gone as well. It's not, it wasn't far from the uh, pig stand. Um, <clears throat> just to show, I'm really glad I started taking these photographs when I did, because everything you see on this page is gone. Uh, the waffle shops of Longview. I, I took this photo just about four years ago, and that sign is gone. Um, the, uh, D, the Triple D Motel in Wichita Falls, um, somebody who actually lives in my neighborhood bought that sign. I don't know where it is right now, um, but it's probably coming to Austin. The Scott Theater in Odessa has been torn down. Um, the High Ho, uh, this was part of a wonderful assemblage of signs in Grand Prairie, totally mucked up, not recognizable. And this original portion of it, the High Ho Dancing Club, um, it's gone. 
Um, some more. These are also from my Instagram account. Back when I, I played around with the settings a little bit, um, made them a little bit uh, garishly colored. I, I've changed my aesthetic since then. The Howdy Doody in Denton just mercilessly um, changed. Um, it's so terrible what they did. The corral in Victoria that was knocked out by a hurricane a few years ago. Um, this one had uh, Native American shooting arrows, flaming arrows that were strung on a line across the parking lot. Um, and then they hit the restaurants and uh, burst into flames. Um, but the sign got basically knocked over and bent way out of shape and it was not salvaged. Um, Texas Fireproof Storage in Waco. Um, that's been repurposed as a, it's now it's a whiskey company, which is not, not the worst use of a building, but I wish they could have kept the sign. And then finally, Kim's also in Waco. The sign still stands, but the coffee shop and the great word drivateria, that's gone. Drivateria um, is no longer part of the sign. Oh, here's, here's that sign in, in, in Grand Prairie. It was crazy. Instead of just removing an old sign, they just kept adding on to it over time. Um, and to the point where they added those little sat satellites on, on top. Um, it's been, it's not recognizable anymore. Um, this is in East Austin. Um, I'm, I'm, I photograph a lot of these, um, these, uh, these plastic signs. Um, you know, they, they weren't probably of much appeal uh, at the beginning of the SCA, but uh, they're, are now, they're now being recognized, of course, as being historic in their own right. As you can tell by this photograph, it's, they're very um, prone to, to breakage, um, whether just by the elements uh, running their course or by vandalism just kids throwing junk at it. And so uh, last Gregory, time I checked, this is all Gregory. Yes. Can you hear me? It's Brian here. Yes. Uh, we got about five minutes left. So okay. take your five minutes and show us some more of these magnificent signs. They're wonderful. Okay, uh, great. I'll, I'll, I'll come in again in five minutes. Okay. I want to show off Houston. Uh, Houston um, is such a great city. Um, it's, uh, I live in Austin. Obviously, this is where I work. This is my home. But uh, if I had to live anywhere else in Texas, it would, it would be Houston. It's, um, uh, you might hear um, there's a saying about Austin, keep Austin weird. Uh, the same could be said about Houston. Houston is wonderfully weird. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that there is no zoning, I know it's a headache for historic preservation. I know that a lot has been lost, but it's a very exciting and dynamic city. Um, it's a it's a petri a petri dish of what happens when there are very few controls over what can be built. Um, so I'm going to show you some of my favorites, um, the, the the best uh, one of the best googie restaurants, googie style um, in the whole state is the Dot Coffee Shop. I don't know if I have a photo of the restaurant itself. This is on the Gulf Freeway. Um, more of Houston, one of the best tourist courts with one of the most fantastic signs. Um, just on the north side of, uh, of Houston, um, just about a mile or so north of, of downtown. It's incredible that this is still intact. Um, the sign is beautiful. Um, the units are still there. Um, it's, it's wonderful. Um, here's a close-up. I mean, it's showing its age with the rust and all that. Um, but the neon is seemingly intact. I don't know if it lights up still or, or not. Um, but it's, it's a gem. Um, significant at the state level, for sure. Um, downtown, this is around the corner from where the pink pussycat was. Um, there's still a little bit of this um, character left in the downtown area. Back when the survey photos were taken, when the pink pussycat was, fo was photographed, this was a rather large red light district. So lots of um, burlesque clubs and things like that. Um, and uh, I think all of that is gone. Um, and fortunately, I mean, for us, people who like this sort of stuff, um, this sort of wacky signage um, is, is still intact. And you, you can see, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's the large signage and then the smaller neon si signage um, uh, ad advertising deans, uh, the Sears. This Sears just closed. I don't, I don't know what's in its future. Um, but this Sears had its own had its own bus stop 
Uh, I don't know of another one like it in the country. Um, the Harmony Wedding Chapel. Again, I, I since the pandemic, I haven't really been able to go out and travel as much. I'm just starting to do this again. Um, so most of these photographs, you know, these are all pre-pandemic. And so I can't vouch for whether or not any of these things are still in, in business. But the Harmony Wedding Chapel always intrigued me. Um, was very happy to go inside and um, see all the all the photographs of the happy couples, um, the no refunds on wedding or receptions notice. Um, here's here's the chapel, you know, it is what it is. Um, the Elmo Plaza Motor Court, which is on the Old Spanish Trail and in the city of Houston, it is called Old Spanish Trail. And it's neither old nor Spanish nor a trail because it was a motor highway. Um, that was uh, developed during the Good Roads Movement in the early 20th century. Alamo Plaza was a chain of motels that were located all over the place, San Antonio, Waco, uh, New Orleans, um, all, all throughout the South. And this is one of the best examples. Um, the only one that I know of that's intact and has its original signage, I know the one in, in Dallas, um, the building is gone and the signage has been pulled apart and it's been repurposed in a new shopping center. Wolf's um, on the southeast side of Houston, where we have a lot of potential for historic districts and a historically African-American neighborhood. Those are things that we're looking at right now. This is around the corner from where the, where the, El, the El Dorado Ballroom is. A lot of historic motels, um, a really good cluster. So we, we've been looking at this area um, fairly recently as high potential for historic districts. Um, just more wacky stuff in Houston. Uh, the the building with the giant Bible on 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 top. I can't get into the details of who built it when, but you know this stuff is scattered all around Houston. Um, some of my favorite signs: the Shipley Donuts. I think it's the only one of its kind still standing. My understanding is the Lee Wright sign might not be standing anymore. Um, these were photographs that I took when I went on a. On a, on a day trip uh, to meet my friend Molly Black, who is a photographer in Houston. Some of you might know her. She takes great roadside photographs. And so she, she toured me around and showed me some of her favorite sites. Um, and not too far from Houston in Richmond, Texas, in, um, in Fort Bend County, an incredible cluster of historic roadside architecture. The 2Ms, Malton Burger Mart, Larry's Mexican Restaurant, the former Texas cafe, there was a similar one in, um, in Bastrop, Texas. Um, the Bastrop sign is gone. This is still there. It's now, um, uh, uh, it's been renamed uh, Eridera's restaurant. Um, and I'm just gonna show you some miscellaneous stuff um, that I've seen around the state. Um, as I said, I've been to all the counties. It took me 11 years to go to all the counties. And every time I go out, I always see something new. This was just outside of Beeville. I don't know why a KFC bucket was just sitting in the middle of a field. So I photographed this. The Dixie Motel in, in um, Brenham in Washington County, which is up just to the northwest of, of Houston. Um, Dixie harkens back to, you know, the, 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 the old, old South advertising air conditioning. Um, we take photographs of things like this along the road. Um, contenders for the largest peanut in Texas. Um, we we have gone out and measured. The one in Parasol, Texas on the left is definitely larger than the giant peanut, which is not so giant, on the Courthouse Square in Floresville in, um, in Wilson County. Um, I'm interested in old dangerous playgrounds um, with old metal equipment that must get extremely hot in the summertime. This stuff because of safety concerns or whatever is being torn out as fast as I can photograph these things. This one is in um, Athens, Texas. Lots of these little statues around Texas, Popeye in Crystal City, which was spinach capital, White Deer, it, the namesake of White Deer, Texas, up in the Panhandle. I, I love this because this is Bovina, Texas. So here's your bovine statue, the Sands Motel, and then in the background, you know, this is the mainstay of Bovina, Texas. Um, you got the cattle and you got the grain, all in this one photograph with the motel in between. Um, the XIT on the side of the, of the steer is for the XIT ranch. 
which covered a good swath of the western portion of the Panhandle. Uh, more of these large things. Um, the Pilgrim, um, uh, outside of the Pilgrim Chicken Factory in, uh, in near Pittsburgh, Texas, and the Giant Cowboy up in Randall County outside of Canyon, which was just repainted. Uh, one of the great- Okay, yeah, uh, Gregory. Am I out of time? Yeah, it's, it's eight o'clock central and nine o'clock Eastern, so. Okay. Oh, this is great. We're just, just I know. Give me one more minute and just a quick run through. How about you wrap up in a minute? Oh, I'm 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 done now. If we have if we have questions, I'll 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 end it there and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can and we can talk. Okay, well, that's great. Now, who was that young uh, gentleman in the last slide that you showed sitting on? Uh, the that was me. Uh, not that long ago. <laughs> oh wow. Well, and, and let me apologize for saying that you joined the Texas Historical Commission in 1966 because my script does say 96. I just misread it. So uh, I th thought I'd comment on your age or anything like that. Well, that was a wonderful presentation. You know, it's, you, you go from, la I was laughing my head off during half of it, especially with the marriage chapel and the Texas shaped pools. Um, and then, you know, it's sad when you get the, um, the losses and the things that have been gone. So it was a real, real up and down, but what a top-notch show. I was highly, highly impressed by that. And all, Thank especially you. the resource that you have down there in Texas. It's remarkable. Um, we have some questions. And um, actually, Michael Hirsch, our president, has asked uh, a the first question. Michael, are you still on the line? If you can unmute yourself, you can ask a question about the Orange Show. Michael? No, well, Michael just asked the question. He said, can you explain the Orange Show, please? Okay. Um, it was, um, it, well, it was it was a built environment uh, made by, he didn't call himself an artist. His, 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 his name was, uh, was McKissick. Um, he was a former postal worker, truck driver. Um, and uh, actually, while he was building the Orange Show, um, uh, William de Koenig came by. Uh, I think Marilyn Oshman or maybe Monique, Dim, uh, Monique ben, Dimanil, both of them patrons of the arts in Houston, uh, came by and brought William de Koenig to see uh, Jeff McKissick and, and the work that he was doing. And uh, he was introduced as a painter and McKissick said, oh, you should, you should come to Houston. There's lots of buildings going up. There's oh, lots of buildings need painting. Had, had no concept of, 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 of him as an artist, and, and uh, he didn't consider himself an artist. Um, so he's a, a true visionary. Um, he was recognized as such, you know, as an, as an artist um, uh, af af after he passed away, or around the time, you know, while he was building it by people like Marilyn Oshman and, Mo and Monique de Manil, um, who recognized, hey, this is something. Um, and so a foundation was started to preserve it they started the art car parade and art car show in Houston, uh, which has been a, 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 a hallmark of Houston culture. Um, we attended it once when it was held in the Asperdale. Um, and so he, he built it, he expected 300,000 people a year to show up. Um, that obviously did not happen. Uh, he didn't have the capacity for it anyway. And he died very shortly after it opened. Oh, okay. Well, that's a sad, sad note, but very, very interesting. Um, we have a question from, um, oh, and by the way, Deborah Jane uh, Seltzer has been uh, providing lots of commentary as you go along on various signs that you've showed because of course she's a resident authority on signs. And so you'll see that all in the chat when, when I send that to you. Um, we have had a question here, let me find it. Oh yes, it's from Gregory Hasman. Gregory, are you still on the line? If you, if so, please unmute yourself, and I'll I'll just pose the question. It says, yes, I, oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Gregory. Uh, ask uh, your question directly to uh, Gregory. Uh, great presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, what are some challenges? Maybe some newer challenges than you've seen in recent years regarding historic preservation, especially uh, that of signs. Well, you know, one of the issues. With, well, there's a few things. Um, one, I think they're being recognized as being significant to the point where there's now a huge market um, for buying these things. Uh, and so a lot of them are being saved. Some of them are being saved in museums. 
Um, a lot of them are in private collections. As I mentioned, there's somebody in Austin who's going around buying up signs. Um, some of them are on display at the grocery store down the street um, where we live. Um, we happen to have the sign from that grocery store in our front yard, a uh, 25 foot sign uh, advertising the, the Crestview grocery store. Uh, and so, you know, there's a market for these things. And so, and they fetch a lot of money. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one of the issues. And then obviously, you know, the signs, when they no longer advertise the business that's there, um, they become less useful to future owners and developers. And, you know, definitely with the, the growth of development all over the state, but especially in the big cities, we see it in Austin, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, there are a lot of these new four and five story mixed use residential buildings that are being built. Um, the these generally nondescript four, you know, four or five story wood frame buildings um, that, you know, maximize the, um, the footprint of the lot that we're on. And there's, there's no place for this. Uh, the roadside signs and, uh, and, and buildings and, and so forth. So it's, it's still a challenge, even though people recognize this and even though people want to see these things preserved, um, the, the real estate market makes it that much more difficult. Um, we are fortunate that sometimes there's this intersection where we have an owner who, who does recognize the significance and does not want to sell out you know, to the highest bid um, just for the sake of preserving it and making the use of the building as it is. It's rare but it, it still happens. Okay, yeah, any, any follow-up, Gregory, on that? I guess what can be done, um, especially with those signs going to big private collections. I live in Albuquerque, but I lived in Texas for nine years, and I've seen what it's done here as well as in the Lone Star State. Uh, what, what can be done for residents and people in communities who want to preserve these signs? Well, I mean, unfortunately, um, we're looking at the highest bidder. Uh, and so there's a few, I mean, I know a lot of museums and so forth have been able to um, make use of old signs. Um, some of the larger ones are, are difficult to move and preserve and, and so forth. But unfortunately, you know, the, the greatest means of preserving something is to own it yourself. Uh, and so if you have the deep pockets, you, you buy it and, and, and you, you preserve it. Texas is a very strong property rights state. Um, the National Register, as you might be familiar, doesn't carry any restrictions. It's a means to promote preservation and awareness, um, an entry point for preservation through the state and federal tax credits, but it doesn't offer that level of protection that's usually left at the local level. So there are cities um, several, you know, lots of them in Texas, probably around 50 or more that have their own preservation ordinances. Houston is one of them where um, historic districts and historic properties can be designated at the local level um, through a program that offers a means of protection with some restrictions as to what that owner or future owners can do with that, that property. Um, sometimes some are more strict than others. Uh, so that's, it's it's tough, uh, especially especially in um, in places where property rights reign reign supreme. Well, it's interesting because uh, in the SCA journal that that Gregory uh, showed at the beginning, uh, we have a column, a, a monthly, a regular column <clears throat> called Ephemera, and it's uh, the woman who writes it. It's usually paper based things, menus, that sort of stuff. But in fact, my experience has been that everything SCA is ephemera. The signs, they come and go. It, it's just, they, they blow away in the wind, the motels, all the rest of it, unless there's a concerted effort to keep something there, uh, which is depressing, but at least we can document them and we can have fun with them while they're still around. Now, Gregory, another question for you. Are you aware, this is from, uh, let me see what the fellow's name is, Jerry Stefani. Jerry, are you still on the, online? You can unmute yourself if you like. Uh, Jerry's question, Gregory, is are you aware of any historic preservation organizations, especially involved with roadside architecture in the Dallas, Texas area? Well, um, aside from the, well, I mean, 
a lot of the larger cities in Texas do have preservation organizations. So we've got Preservation Houston. In Dallas, we have Preservation Dallas. Uh, in Austin, we have Preservation Austin. Uh, San Antonio has a concert, the San Antonio Conservation Society, Galveston Historical Foundation. Most of these preservation organizations, um, most if not all of them, are in tune with the significance of roadside re resources. And so I don't know of an organization that specifically focuses on roadside architecture in any of those places. Um, there is a mid-text mod, uh, Docomomo has a Texas chapter. And so there's a lot of intersection there, um, but I would say most cities that have a preservation organization has an organization that understands this and, and sees the merit in documenting and preserving these things. Okay, thank you. Now, that's the end of the questions in the chat. Is there anybody that would like to just make a comment? That, by the way, there's a ton of comments in here, uh, Gregory, for you about how wonderful your presentation was. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, oh, here's one from Jeremy, uh, who's the, uh, who's on the board at the SCA. He says, I wrote a thesis in 2020 about protecting historic neon signs. It gets into some of what Greg has suggested and he provides a link, uh, there for anybody who's interested. Uh, any other questions or comments from any of our viewers? We still have 43 people online. Um, just to unmute yourself and, and say hello and, and talk to Gregory. Anything? Okay, well, we're running uh, way over. <laughs> it's 9-11. Uh, that's like not uncommon for me, sorry. 8-11 yeah, in Central, so that's a little better earlier. Over here on the, in the East Coast, people are starting to think about going to bed. Um, Gregory, that was a top-notch presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I've actually, I've never been to Texas, but I am looking forward to our, I think our 50th anniversary conference is scheduled for 2027 in Austin, Texas. And so that will be my first visit and I'm really looking forward to it. I'd like to thank you again for the time and trouble you took. And also I'd like to thank uh, Preservation Houston and particularly Jim Parsons for reaching out to do this collaboration with the SCA. We've done a number of them now and, uh, and it's, um, it's proving to be a very fruitful association. And as I said, in too much time on Tuesday, September 19th, Preservation Houston will be providing a show about the House of the Century, which all the SCA people will be invited to watch that one as well. Now, I would like to remind everybody about next month, uh, which is uh, Wednesday, August the 3rd, coming up soon at 8 p.m. Eastern. And uh, Irene Lule, who is the secretary of the SCA, and Beth Dodd, who's a curator of the Alexander Architectural Archives, and I might say is Gregory, our presenter tonight, uh, wife, a <laughs> partner. Uh, we'll be talking about personal collections focused on documenting the American roadside. So that's Wednesday, August 13th, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Also, if you uh, know people that wanted to watch this, but they were not able to catch it uh, live, it will be posted on the SC website and also on the Preservation Houston website a recording of Gregory's presentation and also all the questions and answers. So uh, just refer people to there and, um, and we'll take it from there. So with that, I'll thank you again, Gregory, and I will wish all of our viewers from the SCA and Preservation Houston uh, a good night and we'll see you next month.